Hi, it's Dr. Sandy Kramer, one of the surgeons of Visionary Eye Doctors. Thank you again for joining us for the EYE show. Please subscribe and pass it on to your friends and family and your kids and even grandkids because we are going to talk today about step two of the step ladder for dry eye. We talked last time about step one. And so step two, you, many of you have seen on my YouTube channel, this kind of crazy sheet with all the tools in the world available to just kind of help patients just understand where they are in the toolbox or in the step ladder of just treatments. We're trying to just show patients what all the tools or options are for treating their symptoms of dry eye uh, so we can get you better. So the goal, as I've mentioned many, many times, is to never notice your eyes, never feel them, never have any burning, not feel tired, not feel itching, uh, of course have no redness, or anybody kind of staring at your eyes saying, what's wrong with you? Are you on drugs? Which we hear a lot of. So we're trying to help with that and prevent that from happening. Uh, the, the concern right now is that one of the key complaints in nursing homes and for older people is dry eye pain and, and also eye problems. So we're trying to kind of help decrease that, especially with now all of us on screens more and more. So last time we talked about the number one step, which is the most important, trying to do the warm compresses, uh, massaging, what's called lid hygiene or cleaning of the eyelids and blinking exercises. And so step two is basically diet, medications and lifestyle. And that also includes blinking exercises. There's particularly blinking exercise apps out there that you can do. The idea is just to blink. And that blinking does two things. It basically, first of all, it probably does more than two things. I'll go through that, what I mean in just a minute, but blinking is crucial because it does the, the physical anatomical component of actually having the upper lid touch your lower lid, push the oil out of the oil gland, the meibomian gland, so that meibomian gland will produce more oil. So that blinking is crucial. That's number one. Number two is it, of course, protects your eye. It re regenerates the tear film to help all the nerves on your cornea be able to not start to stimulate pain, pain, like that kind of, you know, stimulus. So it's providing a barrier, protection, rejuvenating the tear. That's number two. Number three, it probably helps to some extent with kind of not allowing the eyeball to stay focused, which may cause the growth of the eyeball and cause myopia. So we have some data to show that when you are staring for hours at a time or a lot of concentration, the inner accommodation of the lens inside the eye does uh, get affected where your eyeball starts to grow. So kids that are on screens a lot or on computer time uh, will have their eyeball grow. And I've told the story of my, my sister who will tell you the story herself, a head of oculoplastics now at Stanford. She came to rotate with me when I was at Harvard when she was a medical student for about two weeks. I checked her vision before she, no, before she started college. Um, she came to rotate with me because she was interested in medicine for about two weeks. And so I checked her vision before she did her rotation and it was 2020, no need for glasses. She starts college and then goes on to medical school. And then by the time I see her back again, I think a few years later, she had done so much studying. She went from Plano, meaning not needing glasses, Glasses, so 2020 without glasses to needing a minus two and a half. Anyway, I was shocked. The idea was that back at that time, we thought the eyeball would stop growing at the age of 15 or 16. But that was my first experience with a personal relative whose eyeball kept growing after the age of 21, probably. So that is still a concern. So that's number three. So the, the blinking has probably an effect on that. That's not been proven. That's a theory of mine. Uh, number four is another theory of mine is that blinking and then that physical, obviously, looking away is probably helping prevent brain connections that lead to addiction, to gaming, phone, all kinds of things. So the blinking is crucial. And that those last two, of course, are more theoretical. But I do think blinking is crucial. So blinking exercises is the idea that you're just blinking. You can be like 15 blinks in one minute or that kind of thing or, or 10 blinks in, in 10 seconds or something like that that kind of reminds you to blink. I generally tell people to try to blink about every two or three seconds. And if you're not able, especially if you have my booming gland dysfunction, the average blink is about one every five seconds or so. And then if you're on screens, it can decrease to one every 10 to 15 seconds. So if you have my booming gland dysfunction or dry eyes, I tell people, you know, take these long pauses as you blink, talk to people with your eyes closed. It is not normal obviously to do that so you might have to tell your family or friends that you do have dry eyes obviously if you're in a, an interview or doing zoom you might have to explain yourself if you have dry eyes but the idea is to try to just kind of fully close your eyelids because what happens with 
screen time is that it's led to an increase in partial blinking. So you don't fully close, you partially close, and that prevents the meibomian gland from being milked, which leads to more dry eye. So that's blinking exercises. Okay, so diet. Diet is controversial. I've done many podcasts on diet, and it's a big passion of mine because I find it super fascinating because we all eat and it's very important. Um, but the studies are mixed on what works for dry eye. Uh, common sense is obviously a good thing here. So I think, and most doctors think, eating omega-3 good healthy oils like omega-3 like fish oil uh, is very good for you. The question is how much is good for you? And that's again controversial. So we have a range from recommended 2,000 to 4,000 milligrams a day. If you listen to Dr. P uh, Longo or Dr. Huberman, who is a PhD, um, he has a Huberman Lab podcast, which I love. Uh, he is a 4,000 milligram omega-3 uh, pill taker and has these drinks that has omega-3. So he's probably on the right side. And Dr. Sinclair at Harvard is the longevity doctor. Highly also enjoy his information. They're more along the lines of take a lot of omega-3 because it's heart protective. It helps your joints. It's good for your immune system. We think it does help with dry eye, but the studies have not really shown that clearly. And there's issues with some of the studies, which I've talked about in previous podcasts, but I eat omega-3. I think you should too if you can tolerate it. Uh, the question is how much and how should you take it? I like to eat it as wild salmon, nuts, chia seeds, flax seeds, uh, but of course there's pills, Udo's oil, PRN is probably the best known brand name. Super expensive for a lot of my patients of course and for us. My husband loves it but um, it does work. So those are wonderful options. Okay now check medications. That is probably the number one uh, issue with dry eyes for a lot of patients. If you're taking any type of anti-anxiety pill, antidepressant, uh, antipsychotic, uh, Benadryl, there's or an allergy pills, they do dry out the tear film, both the aqueous and probably meibomian gland layer. So just be aware to check your medications. Uh, so because medications can make dry eyes worse. Uh, right here, of course, blink often, avoid electronic screens, fans, and direct AC, uh, air conditioning and heat. Uh, screen time is, of course, still very controversial. We published a paper last year, as you, many of you know, American Journal of Ophthalmology about the children that are on screens on average eight hours a day, which was crazy because our youngest patient was eight years old uh, to 18. So we have to figure out some way to have people not, especially kids, not be on screen so much. So I tell patients we don't have a great, like, what's the... Like what's what's the screen time supposed to be? If you ask me and my kids, or you ask me and my kids would complain, I would say really no screen time until they're like five, six. I mean, why? You know, maybe a little TV, maybe a little half an hour here or there uh, when you're cooking or something, but really try to minimize it. It's not worth it. Don't give your child a cell phone, ideally, until their frontal lobe is developed, which is technically 20 there's two, 23, but obviously you need it before then. So just obviously um, trying to teach children and yourself to have prudence and and just being, you know, just kind of prudent with using your cell phone. So don't just, you know, stream TikTok for like an hour. That is bad, bad for your eyes. Don't do that. Don't let your kids do that. So we talk a lot about this at, at home, which as you can imagine, my kids really are not happy with, but we try to minimize it. So I try to minimize it to less than four hours for the middle schoolers, um, high schoolers, uh, very little for the elementary school kids. So I, I've noticed that with my, we have six kids, with the oldest kids, they didn't get a cell phone until almost graduation, and they did very little screen time. The next two kids, they're getting cell phones in ninth, tenth grade, tenth grade, the oldest, and ninth grade is the the fourth boy. Um, so I'm like, ah, so it's kind of I can see it already being an addiction. So I'm kind of trying to push it away. So I'm I'm very careful to make sure, you know, his room is clean. He's he's doing his chores. He's feeding the dog, washing the dog, doing all those things. Or I just have to take away the phone, and I, it's it's painful for him, um, but it's I can see it already starting. My fourth child, my sorry, my fifth child so far has not been asking for a phone, praise the Lord, and she's been very, very responsible, and it goes to a school where cell phones are really looked down upon, which is very rare, and her friends don't have cell phones, which is awesome. So anyway, so it's kind of one of those things, and then my fifth child, my sixth child, um, I think wanted a cell phone when she was in the crib, so <laughs> we're going to have issues with that, I can already see it. So. The point is that it's a struggle for all parents. I'm a parent myself. I know what you're going through, but I really, if you if you don't take out the phone during dinner, which is crucial and it's hard, obviously my husband and I work full time, don't take out the cell phone, you're talking to them. Uh, try to dictate to Siri, have Siri dictate to you. I do a lot of that. Uh, to the point that my kids now say, uh, hey mama, period. Can you please pick me up from school, period. <laughs> so it's gotten kind of ridiculous. Anyway, uh, but, um, 
it's just one of the, and, and they'll be talking to me in my face when they say that, so it's very sad. Anyway, so screen time is a big issue, as we know, so trying to minimize it as much as you can and using the things like we talked about, look away, print out material, uh, dictate to Siri, have Siri dictate to you, don't worry about the trees, print out your material. Um, those kinds of things will go a long way. Decreasing the screen color, is I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I just, I was going to post on my, ironically, uh, Instagram account, which I rarely do, an article in the Wall Street Journal again this weekend said that dermatologists swear or say, dermatologists say wrinkles are getting worse because of blue light screen time. Um, I can't find that paper. Maybe I'll ask Mary who's behind, behind the scenes to help me find that paper. But the, the issue is that blue light probably is damaging for the face and maybe the, the health of the face, as well as we know for the eyes. It's just going to take many years to prove causation. So uh, again, decrease screen time and try to have the blue light be less. So blue light filters, I'm a fan of blue light glasses, of course, sunglasses, hat, big fan of those kinds of obvious things that you should do. Uh, tell your children, kids from the very beginning, blue light protection is crucial for your eyes, your retina, your lens, and maybe even for your potential risk of wrinkles in the future. Okay. Here we go. Next one is wearing Xena dry eyes, ski goggle glasses, moisture chamber glasses, panoptics, tranquilize, wrap around sunglasses for wind and sun. So I'm a big fan of these products. So Xena is now a new company. I think there's another one that just came out called Seven, uh, S-E-V-E-N. You can look it up on, on Google, unfortunately. But the idea is that something that will protect you when you're outside. It's like these kind of not so sexy, but not terribly unsexy, kind of, you know, nice glasses that kind of can go over your glasses to protect you from wind, uh, perfume. People can be allergic to perfumes or very sensitive to perfumes or smells, mold, things like that can kind of protect you. So keep that in mind during the day. And then there's moisture chamber goggles at nighttime that you can wear. And as I mentioned in the previous podcast, some of my patients will put in the Manuka uh, medical grade Manuka honey or coconut oil or even uh, olive oil or castor oil, ideally medical grade that's not contaminated. Uh, along the eyelid margin and then put a press and seal, alternate eyes every other night so you don't develop any infection and you don't fall if you wake up in the middle of the night, so be careful with that. But those things do help provide, kind of provide this moisture during the day and during night. And at nighttime, the oils will suffocate bacteria and mites that reproduce at nighttime, so we love those. Wrap around sunglasses and sunglasses in general, hat, crucial. We talked about that. Humidifier, HEPA filter, especially in the winter time, is crucial. HEPA filter, if you have allergies, is crucial. We have two of them in our house. They're called the IQ Doctor. I'll put a link in the um, uh, video. And then, so that's basically the natural things. And then I talk a little bit more about diet, intermittent and prolonged fasting, and exercise decreased inflammation. Check with your MD always before you do any type of fasting. Drinking at least eight glasses of water a day is crucial. If you wanna produce good tears, and obviously for your whole body, drinking water is crucial. Uh, filtered spring water every day. Filtered, you know, obviously just to protect you from other things. Spring water, I couldn't find any paper on that, but that was recommended in the past, so I just kept that in my sheet. Avoid reverse osmosis or distilled water intake due to high acidity and low mineral content. So that was actually uh, mentioned about maybe 20 years ago in a journal I read. So I haven't seen a recent paper on that, but just keep that in mind. And then the low inflammatory diet, which is very controversial because we don't have any data that I know of to prove that it prevents or really treats dry eye. But there's now more and more data showing that a paleo, gluten-free, sugar-free, dairy-free, or at least trying to decrease those three things, gluten, so carbohydrates, sugar, which is carbohydrates, and dairy, which is a lot of carbohydrates, um, do help longevity, uh, help prevent cancer, and help uh, just basically your whole body. So I've had now thousands of patients that have literally really honestly have come in crying or thanking me for changing their life because I told them to go gluten-free. It changed their, their whole life. They, they have no headaches. They don't have any joint aches. It's crazy, it, but it does work. And not for everybody. I've had maybe two in a thousand that said it didn't help. Uh, maybe there's more and they haven't told me, but it really, to me, is a no-brainer now because it's not as hard as it used to be, for sure, to, to do all these three things. Um, I'm a very spiritual person, so I believe this is good for you spiritually as well, to kind of be detached from things that you really crave, like your bread or your, you know, your, your dairy or whatever it is. So this is the diet I'm on. I'm on the one meal a day diet. It's not every, every single day of my life, but pretty much 90 plus percent of the days and it is it's great it's a good mortification it's it's good to kind of um just feel you know feel that you know you you have a 
hunger in your belly is okay and you don't die and I think it's good for you but of course ch check with your medical, medical doctor before you do this so I do mention still these great traditional these classic books called Grain Brain Good Calories Bad Calories Good Books to Read um, Serve to Win by uh, Djokovic it was a great book I loved that was many years ago and then the key doctors now I mentioned are Dr. Longo I mentioned in my previous podcast Dr. Sinclair who's at Harvard um Dr. Gundry is a cardiothoracic surgeon. So they're all kind of in this right ballpark of what they're saying. They all agree. Dr. Furman, plant-based diet uh, doctor. There's, you know, different doctors that kind of agree that, you know, processed foods are bad. Gluten and most carbohydrates generally are bad. Some There's controversy in that, of course. Uh, sugar is bad. Everyone can kind of agree. Artificial sugar is bad. Water is good. Uh, wild salmon is good. That's about pretty much what everybody agrees on and everything else is controversial. Okay, so that's the diet. And then I mentioned to use um, the spices, curcumin, turmeric. Uh, there's all kinds of spices out there which are excellent uh, to decrease inflammation, anti-angiogenic. The idea is to decrease the ability of blood vessels to grow. And so we know cancer uh, grows because it recruits its own blood supply and then it can grow bigger and then metastasize. And we've talked about this before. Dr. Folkman, who was at Harvard, who was my mentor at Harvard, uh, kind of showed this initial angiogenesis basis for cancer, and which led to the new treatment protocols for anti-angiogenic medications for diabetic retinopathy, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, meaning pro pro new blood vessels proliferate and increase, so that's why it's called proliferative diabetic retinopathy, as well as wet macular degeneration, meaning that wet means blood vessels are bleeding because there's new blood vessels that have come in, there's been angiogenesis, and these new blood vessels are abnormal. They have an abnormal endothelial lining, so they leak, and that's what leads to blindness. That's what leads to diabetics needing to get their toes and legs and 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 fingers amputated. Uh, so it's it's an issue because when the blood vessels leak, the oxygen does in those in that blood doesn't get to the right location of the tissue, and then it becomes necrotic. So that happens also in the eye, kidney, liver brain everywhere. So that's why we want to have an anti-angiogenic diet, an anti-inflammatory diet, because inflammation and angiogenesis are pretty much the same thing. Pretty not, not exactly, but similar. So that's the idea. Okay, I hope everybody understood that one. Let me know if you didn't. Please feel free to text me or, or you know, email me. Okay, then I talk about um, some kind of more uh, other studies a little bit talk about for severe dry eyes, take 160 milligrams a day of GLA ROM black currant seed oil or and drink 16 ounces of coconut water per day. This is not randomized control perspective data at all. And I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, this is a suggestion that some doctors have used to help, that have helped some patients. I have had some patients do this and it does help. I've been actually surprised by it, but it's not like a, I can prove that it works or it'll work for you. It's one of those things that sometimes you have to try it. I personally uh, do the diet and I haven't taken any of the medications or the, I should say these uh, black currant seed oil. Uh, I do drink a little bit of coconut water every few weeks or so. I generally kind of just do the warm compresses, blinking, minimal screen time. So those are the key things. Okay, the most important of step two is to tell your doctor if you have dry mouth, arthritis, joint aches, back aches, any weird rashes, any weird dry mouth, joint aches, anything like that, you got to tell your doctor because if it's you have dry eyes potentially, which we'll talk about in future podcasts about aqueous, and we've talked about it in the past, aqueous versus oil deficiency. So aqueous is water deficiency. Oil is the meibomian gland deficiency. Uh, Sjogren's syndrome and a lot of the autoimmune diseases cause both. So if you have dry eyes and dry mouth and arthritis, there's probably an immune issue affecting all of the layers of the tear film. And when we say autoimmune disease, we mean anything from thyroid issues, hypothyroid, Hashimoto's, eczema, rosacea, of course, lupus, Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there's all different types of autoimmune diseases out there. So please let us know because we've been diagnosing more autoimmune disease from the mybography and from the dry eye component than I would have ever expected when I when I started ophthalmology. So just to show people on, on YouTube one more time, the meibomian gland should look kind of like these white lines filled with oil on this mybography. This one particularly is a lip of view or a lip of scan. And with aging, these oil glands dry up. If somebody comes to me with stage three or four meibomian gland atrophy and they're six, seven, eight, younger than 50, 
and they don't use screens that much or they're not big screen users, even if they don't have dry mouth and arthritis, we will, I will often order the blood work for autoimmune disease. And we've, I've diagnosed more Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis and thyroid issues in the last 10 years since we've had our myography than I have in my entire career. It's really been shocking. So uh, definitely let your doctor know if you have those. So that's it for um, the diet lifestyle. And if you have any other tips or pearls that have worked for you. Oh, let me mention one more thing. Please let me know. But let me mention one more thing. There was an article and there's now been, I think, two or three articles on exercise. So I'm a big a fan of exercise, ideally at least 30 minutes a day aerobic is what the papers mention, improve dry eye symptoms. And I first thought or heard of this suggestion about maybe 15 years ago when a patient of mine had terrible dry eyes and we tried pretty much everything at that time and she started doing CrossFit training and she said she was in so much pain in the rest of her body that her eyes no longer bothered her and I thought interesting so I didn't know whether it was because the muscles were hurting so much in the rest of her body that it made the brain not sense pain in her eyes and so we thought at that time she might have what's called neuralgia which is pain in the in the cornea from the corneal nerves being stimulated that's kind of a pathway to the brain so i didn't know what was kind of the ultimate cause of her dry or her her eye pain um, but the crossfit significantly helped her so whether it's crossfit or just aerobic exercise of any kind check with your medical doctor before doing an aggressive treatment of our, our exercise regimen but i think it does work so on multiple levels so i will do a podcast of soon on exercise itself in terms of dry eye helping but just consider that as well and then the last thing which has definitely not been proven but I'm a big fan of is meditation and prayer I tell people that if you don't sleep well sleep is a crucial component of step two which should be really uh, you know emphasized here sleeping well is crucial to rejuvenate your whole body especially your tear film so if you're not sleeping well you need to talk to your medical doctor uh, talk to somebody that can really help you with your sleep issues and I always tell pe people even if you're not Catholic get a rosary and learn to pray that rosary and I promise you you'll be asleep before you get through that whole rosary I mean most people are and if not at least pray for me uh, so I'm Dr. Kramers thank you for joining me on the EYE show please subscribe please send it to your friends please review the podcast and please let us know what other topics you want us to discuss. Okay, have a great day. Thank you.